The last speaker in this session is Jim Wisnowski, and uh, he's going to be talking about a challenging test environment uh, where he's actually applied STEM. So this will be a nice real-world case study to follow uh, the introduction that Chris has given us. Thanks, Tom. Um, so this is some work that uh, we have been doing with the DOD. Uh, Andrew Carl works uh, with us. He um, does all the scripting and all the simulations, and uh, I get to take credit for it. And also working with uh, Jim Simpson that many of you know um, here. And um, I will say, uh, so this is kind of design of experiments. All of you are probably very familiar with DOE, and probably you learned it from a textbook by maybe Montgomery kind of things. So that's not familiar to anybody. Yeah, so. Uh, so anyway, my use case uh, on this is going to be hypersonics. So hypersonics, we are behind in hypersonics. We need to catch up. I mean, already we're seeing in Ukraine that uh, Russia is, is employing hypersonic technology. China has demonstrated aggressively um, some capability there. Uh, so this is high priority for, for DOD. Um, and the TRL levels aren't quite there yet, right? So uh, this is kind of top priority type thing. But our problem with achieving this is we kind of took a pause that, that we were doing pretty well in, uh, in the competition, if you will. And then we kind of took a pause in the hypersonic world, and now we find ourselves behind. So our TRL is not quite where it needs to be. So um, this community of testers, we need to test more efficiently so that we can kind of get uh, up to speed, if you will, on the hypersonics. So all comes down to the fuel performance for the most part in the inlet design. Uh, so the fuel performance is highly complex where you have many different ingredient classes as well as uh, some of the material choices within the class. Sorry to interrupt you. We had a request to either stand right by the mic or if you want to use a handheld. Okay. I'll, okay. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that um, out there. Uh, so it's all about the hypersonics and it's the fuel and the fuel formulation in particular. Uh, so how did we get involved in this? Um, so there was a program manager that was working this in the, in the, uh, as a contractor, and he had just completed uh, a course, or his degree, actually, a thesis um, in design of experiments with Doug Montgomery at Arizona State, and he tried to get Doug uh, to consult with him because he knew he had a challenging problem. And for those of you that have taken a DOE course or taught a DOE course, you know typically the last thing you do in there is like mixture models, and that's kind of the more difficult ones, right? Uh, so he, he couldn't get Doug, so then he tried, he kept going, going down, down, down. So finally, uh, there's no one left but Jim Simpson uh, and I. <laughs> uh, and this is where uh, we kind of pick up the, the conversation here. Uh, so he says, you know, I just got done. I want Doug, and he won't, he won't do it. So uh, can you guys help? And we say, yeah, probably. We can help. So what, what's going on? And this first thing says, did I tell you I tried to get Doug Montgomery to do this? Like, yeah, we got that. And, and, and by the way, we... Both did get our degrees from Doug, or our PhDs, so we might have, you know, some help to offer. <laughs> um, so, so he said, tell us, what's your test program? What's the problem here? So he, he said, we need to figure out what the right percentage of these chemicals is um, so that we can uh, come up with a fuel that is twice as good as that we've ever done. <laughs> and we're like, twice as good. I'm not sure we can guarantee that, but we do know some of the principles of DOE, uh, in particular with mixture designs and some of the analysis kind of thing. Uh, so, how many uh, how many components do you have in this? Uh, well, we have seven main classes in there, but within each main class, there could be three to ten different choices within that. Uh, and then that's, you know, just part of it is now we have constraints within there. There's stoichiometry, and we go, stoichiometry, that's like chemistry. That, that's bad memories from freshman chem, right? So, uh, so then uh, he keeps saying, and then we've got all these other constraints. If you got E2, you can only have 10% of A1, and, and he keeps going on and on, and, and we're like, oh, boy. And he says, see, this is why we need Doug Montgomery. So I said, hmm, well, you said it needs to be twice as good. Well, what are the responses? So they said, well, we have dozens of responses. I'm glad you asked. Depends on whether you want to optimize it for manufacturability, for, uh, for tactical performance, mechanics, weight. Um, so, and they're not all equally important. So can you help? And we said, yeah, here's Doug.Montgomery at ASU. You need Doug. So you, you have kind of summed up the most difficult and challenging problem you could probably do uh, in this space. Um, so we actually did attack this problem 
Uh, and just kind of a quick uh, idea here on the mixture world is the mixture components you're generally going to have to uh, obey that they're going to sum to one or 90 percent or something like that. So you're already constrained in your design space. And what that does to you, you kind of see uh, on the left graph there that that is the red is your feasible region. That if you have two components, you can only kind of go, uh, you know, you have 40 percent of one, 60 percent of another kind of a thing. And then that, of course, generalizes um, to higher uh, dimensions as well. So our big problem with that is the bottom line there is we now have this dependency, which means we have multicollinearity. Multicollinearity is measured by VIFs, which are variance inflation factors. Variance inflated means you now have type 2 errors. So how can I find where the signal is if I have all of this variance going on? So... Um, so here is um, <laughs> some ideas. So uh, I'm from San Antonio, which is the optimal place on Earth, right? So, uh, so when you think of San Antonio, you're probably conjuring up ice skating rinks, right? So, uh, so I think of uh, ice skating rinks, and I think of San Antonio, and not many people ice skate, so they all kind of hang on the edges, right? Anybody been to ice skating? You kind of see people that are kind of walking like this, right? Uh, and then you have that one person out there who's uh, doing all the, the, the spins and things like that uh, in the middle. So that's uh, what a de-optimal design looks like in the mixture world, where everything is kind of placed out on the edges. And maybe even more unfortunate is sometimes you don't even have any, if you have three ingredients, you have a lot of t combinations where you're only doing two of the three. So it's not really as mixed as well as you like. Uh, contrary to that, uh, maybe the space filling design where you have nice blends uh, in there. So um, so what we want to do is try to figure out how, um, so kind of maybe taking a step back, why am I giving you what Mixture 101 is type thing? It's like, well, before we had to attack this difficult challenging test program, we tried to need to, we kind of needed to educate ourselves on what's our best approach here and what's the latest technology in terms of mixture models. Um, so. The problem with uh, with mixture designs here is uh, that this pushing them out to the outside may not be what your objective is because by definition, if you're doing a mixture, there's probably a lot of excitement that's going on on intermediate values unless you can assume linearity. And that's one of our huge takeaways is you have to be working with the subject matter expert. The chemist uh, is really important to let you know, well, we kind of see in the past that there's some interactions here and there and nonlinearities, so very important. Uh, so we also see uh, uh, this idea of catastrophic events occur at very, uh, un, you, you know, kind of have these cliffs of performance. So you have to kind of keep this in mind as well. So, uh, and then even once you do have a good design, now you have some analysis issues with mixture models that I already touched on that you have this multicollinearity variance inflation. Uh, but not only that, you've got this idea of the no intercept going on. So what that means is you have singularities that if you put in uh, your main effects, uh, they are, in fact, you can see uh, that you have the singularity with the intercept with your main effects. So hence, you have this no intercept uh, that you need to do. Also, if you want to do quadratic, which we do have nonlinear behavior in mixtures as well, is you have to go with a chefe, chefe cubic, which this uh, idea is telling you right now that if you just want a quadratics, that they are going to have singularities uh, in there. So hence, we got some challenges uh, beyond belief, and not only that, uh, we also have uh, issues when we have process factors. So we not only are we working with mixtures, but there's also process factors. So what happens when you have different temperatures, different environments, and different ways to uh, quantify the operational space? Now you have issues between uh, your mixture factors and your process factors. So um, it's it's getting complicated uh, rather quickly kind of a thing. So the hope was that we could use this uh, concept that Chris had just described on the self-validated ensemble model. Uh, so how does that play into this world of mixture designs? So uh, before we got going, you, we had kind of some practical questions that we wanted to answer. So when I think about my design, well, should I use a space filling design or should I use an optimal design? Chris already mentioned uh, some of the de-optimality properties that they saw with box banking, so we had some of that to build on, uh, but we weren't entirely sure how it was going to behave in a mixture uh, environment. 
So uh, and then if I do an optimal, what about I versus uh, D optimal, or even A optimal, or alias optimal? Which ones work? Uh, and then once I do have it, how do I analyze uh, the results? And do I keep that no intercept in or not kind of a thing? So we did some simulations here. Uh, and I will say that um, a lot of this work was done uh, with a biotech framework. So a lot of you had a PCR, uh, a, a vaccine type thing for COVID. All that stuff was done with mixture models, uh, and we did a lot of research, uh, and that's what a lot of this tied into that. Uh, and you'll see some of the examples that we have tied to that. Um, so we're going to do some simulation uh, and figure out, well, what happens if I have a 12-run design where it's kind of just trying to find those main effects versus a little bit better uh, option where we have 40 runs and then now we can can we find something beyond the main effects uh, and look at some second and possibly third order, third order being that chef a cubic uh, kind of a thing. And then what happens if you add five more runs? What do you do with those kind of a things? So uh, <clears throat> our simulation metric here was, was a little bit different. Usually we think of like a, a squared error, try to minimize some sort of a squared error or something like that. But we chose um, kind of what is the percent of maximum. So if you think about if you're trying to uh, figure out you're trying to maximize purity or we're trying to maximize uh, or minimize regression rate. So what is the combination that gets you closest to that ideal? So that was our, our metric was the percent of maximum. Um, so here's our first uh, one up. It's a 12 run D optimal. And you can see that does have the San Antonio ice rink going on there uh, where everything is kind of pushed out to the side. Uh, and uh, we do have these other uh, factors that are in there as the process uh, factors. So here are the results. So if we're trying to find the active factors, which are the best procedures that are out there? And that's kind of what we're looking at uh, over. Uh, in the chart there where we're just looking at um, uh, doing the, uh, what you want to do is maximize. So we're trying to maximize that. And it looks like SFEM with the neural network uh, was our best option with the 92%. And then we can see there's uh, basically all the top half is going to be the SFEM uh, op options in there. Um, but the difference uh, here, and this is the only time we saw that if you use the full model, you're going to do pretty well. Uh, as we go into more complex uh, situations or, or more uh, data-rich uh, environments, you don't really want to go with that full model. So, uh, so takeaway was, okay, SFEM seems to be working pretty well here. Uh, and we can also see that there are some that are not working well at all. Uh, so the lasso with the uh, AIC, AIC is the, uh, instead of using the p-value, because your p-values don't really work as well in the mixture world just for that reason of the multicollinearity and your variance kind of hopping around uh, kind of a thing. Uh, so um, next up uh, is uh, if we did a, uh, uh, let's see. Okay, this is, uh, let's move on one more. Uh, so now what happens if we do space filling? So we did the d-optimal. Uh, now, if we do space filling, uh, once again, we see that the SFEM uh, kind of cluster uh, at the top. And if you, if you see a different letter, then that means it is statistically significant in its difference uh, within the group. Uh, so much as Chris's conclusion was the SFEM forward selection, we're going to second that. In fact, we should have just listened to you and just moved on. So, uh, But SFEM forward selection seems to do uh, really well for us in all situations. Uh, so here is uh, the, uh, we win the award for the best data visualization here. Some of you probably took the class yesterday, uh, and I'm, I'm certain that this was, uh, you know, in there for the first principles of a good data viz. Uh, but <laughs> see if you can spot uh, all of the blue lines in there. Uh, so it's really those blue lines that are of interest. Uh, and what we're saying here is what happens as we go from 12 to 17 runs and we can see that those extra five runs don't necessarily help you out. So what we're trying to think about here in the grand scheme of things, the DOE, is you always want to have some sort of metric, right, for a statistically designed experiment. We can't use power because power is virtually down to 5% because you have so much uh, interdependencies. Uh, so much like some of you see some of the power in some quadratics and things like that. But in, in the mixture world, power is, is not in the prediction variance. So you kind of have different metrics in here. Um, so the, the takeaway here uh, is we, can, we do want to be as high as possible. And we see that the SFEM 
uh, forward selection with the intercept. Remember, we said we don't want the intercept because of that, um, the, uh, where you have your, um, your overall problem with your collinearity, right, your singularity. Um, but we're putting, we're forcing that in. Um, now, SVEM kind of gives us a, a, a way out because we're doing the fractionally weighted bootstrap uh, in there. So, and here we can see that SVEM neural didn't necessarily uh, provide a whole lot of lift. In the 40 run designs, we can see even uh, in the D optimal world um, with 40 runs, we don't see them really going into the center of the space. So keep in mind when with your optimality criterion here, and then we can see the 40 run uh, space fill-in design over there does uh, do it pretty well. Um, one thing I gotta give props to is um, we in this world of hypersonic fuel development had many, many constraints. So we had as many as 30 constraints. So we're running, we're doing uh, our analysis and we did, we did some testing. So we're doing our analysis with uh, designs from 30 constraints and you saw not long ago a prediction profiler that had constraints in it. Well, we very much benefited from that. So thank you very much. In addition to, I think Ryan, you were the one who put in constraints into space fill in designs. So without your two just in time uh, contributions, we would not have been as, as successful as we were uh, in recommending some fuel, uh, hypersonic fuel uh, <clears throat> formulations. So. Um, so anyway, how do things do here? Uh, we can see that the, the uh, once again, the, the SPEM are kind of uh, rising to the top. Uh, we do have uh, the lasso doing a little bit better here in the space filling world, uh, but you can see that the, the full model uh, is not performing uh, well there at all. And that's what this graphic is showing, that our full model, uh, maybe not uh, as well with the D-optimal and uh, or with the space filling, I should say. <clears throat> and the other one is the SVEM with the intercept, or with forward selection. Now, what if you use D and I optimality, uh, or A for that matter? We're fans of A optimal designs in general. Uh, we found, though, with the mixture world, they don't work uh, well. So, and this isn't not just in this study, but some of the other work that we've done uh, with some of our biopharma work. Um, so, uh, between D and I, uh, we can see not, not huge differences there uh, overall. And that gives rise to perhaps what we would recommend is maybe a hybrid design where you start out with that D-optimal design, which are gonna be the red points and, and kind of fill in the exterior, if you will, and then fill in the interior with your space filling. So now these hybrid designs, how do they perform? Well, we don't know, so let's do some simulation uh, kind of a thing. So uh, it, it turns out that <clears throat> we're able to kind of um, do pretty well with the SVEMS forward selection in the hybrid design as well. We also tried some other excursions. Uh, so what happens if we augment a 40 run design with some center points? What if we replicate five different points? What, what's the best policy kind of a thing? Uh, and we really found out that there was not any statistically significant difference in there. Uh, and then what we truly were concerned about on kind of our, our pilot studies here in the simulation was how does the influence of the constraint. How does that really come into play with picking the right variable set? Uh, and it turns out that it really didn't have an impact at all. Much, you know, we were very pleased that we didn't have to work around uh, that because we did have multiple constraints. So uh, probably the, the father of our mixture models and analysis is John Cornell. Uh, so he has his, his, you know, one of his uh, books here. Uh, he pretty much says, you know, if you're really trying to, if you think about two goals of DOE, it's to either characterize a system or optimize, or maybe even both. But if you're trying to kind of get the characterization and understand what the contributions of each factor are, it's an uphill battle when it comes to mixture models. So he says, you know, maybe at the end of the day, the best we can do is just include everything in there and kind of look at the trace plots or what we'll call a prediction profiler uh, in this case. So he kind of put his hands up to say, you know, we really this variable selection thing doesn't work so well in the mixture model world. So what we're able to kind of do is maybe turn that a little bit and say that, you know, it actually doesn't work out too bad when you use FEM that you're able to learn some things. Take away here though, 
is if you look at the best performers, which would be the highest, uh, those would be your uh, self-validated ensemble model forward selection with intercept uh, and lasso are on top, okay? And then what you have here in the middle are gonna be what you call the single shot. So you're not doing that bootstrapping, you're just doing uh, backward selection or forward AIC. Uh, and then the full model, it, you know, it does okay uh, over here, but not nearly as well. So we found that, you know, that, that graphic kind of brings it home that yes, we are seeing significant improvement by using the self-validated ensemble. So uh, a couple couple highlights in here that the, that the no intercept, we may want to uncheck that, uh, that we find with SPEM, it works out pretty well. And um, as Chris mentioned, this SPEM is really very simple in Jump Pro that it's one of your choices. So you don't have to, previous to, uh, I should say 17, in Jump Pro 16, you kind of had to do a little bit of work and setup to get it. Now it's just like, well, do I want to do lasso? Do I want to do double lasso? Do I want to do dancing? Uh, let's do SPEM forward selection. And all you do is you select it and it does it in the background and it may take a bit longer uh, than some of the others uh, if you have a large problem, but in DOE, not, not a problem. So <clears throat> native SFEM, uh, Jump Pro gives you uh, a pretty good complement uh, of uh, opportunities and options kind of thing. So, so the epilogue is, well, how did this end up working out? So we say that SFEM was actually critical to understanding this, okay? So um, what, we're looking at in the upper right hand corner is a prediction profiler. And you'll note that generally when you look at that, those of you that are familiar with the prediction profiler, generally you see a line the whole way, right? Well, here you're not seeing lines the whole way because we have many constraints that are in there. And in fact, we found that uh, <laughs> we were so over constrained that oftentimes we didn't see any lines, <laughs> that there was just one feasible solution and it was a point. So actually, as it turned out, we there's a nice setting in Prediction Profiler that you can kind of let it extrapolate for you. Uh, and that we needed just to kind of see what the trend was. And this is where uh, kind of this uh, bottom line here of most important was working with the SME, that they could look at that and, and understand what the slopes were saying and kind of make some connections there uh, kind of a thing. So, and this was one where we only had five responses. Um, and then we had multiple uh, components that were in there. And then we have ultimately a desirability function here and the dark blue is the best. So we really found out, you know what, if I'm looking at component A1, again, A could have A1 through A10, but I like A1 and B1. And then here is the sweet spot of the percentages of them. So I need maybe what, 30% A1 and 10% B1. But this area up here it doesn't exist because that is a constraint. So, uh, but bottom line uh, is we still uh, needed our old friends of decision trees and neural networks to kind of get going uh, and was very helpful. Uh, and the predictor screening platform was also pretty useful because again, we had many different combinations and just try to see, you know, who's who in the zoo, if you will. Uh, but uh, Svem gave a hypersonic boost to our test program. So. Thanks, Chris. And there were no questions online, but if there's any questions in the room, we have about five minutes left in the session. Well, you're right here, so let me start with you. And so would you say SFEM is a new, like, a, or a better way to do the uh, AICC, BICC forward backward uh, than the traditional methods that I learned, for example, in the Montgomery um, DOE class? Um, at a minimum, SFEM should be used uh, as a complement or at least entertainment, right? Because it's so easy to do uh, if you have Jump Pro is uh, just see what, what does SFEM say kind of a thing. So... Um, it, it likely won't be a bad thing. And again, th the title of this was uh, Challenging Test Scenarios, and I just gave you one, which was the mixture model. Um, but all of our tests are challenging scenarios. And, and Chris mentioned that if we have a small test and we have a super saturated design, SVEM might be almost your only choice in some cases uh, kind of thing. But I'm, I, I'm a more of a, you know, just show me uh, all the different options and, and I'll pick uh, what I like. 
Um, but uh, I think Chris and, and Phil gave a, a good talk on what happens if you have the situation where you're you're trying to predict like a rare event, right? So you have a, a failure or, or the, the transmission of the communication does or doesn't happen. Well, SVEM uh, ends up kind of saving the day because the question earlier about uh, why don't we just do the bootstrap? Well, if you just do the bootstrap, you might have a bootstrap sample that has none of the rare event. <laughs> so, um, so yes, my uh, I, I always like to look at what I'm going to get out of the spam, and, and usually it is near the top. Whether it's a, a, an advanced mixture problem with constraints, or even just a regular uh, definitive screening design or fractional factorial. So. Thank you very much. A very nice uh, presentation, very interesting and, and important uh, to, to national security. Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier in the presentation was about multiple responses and being important uh, at, at equal proportions. So can you say a little bit more about how you dealt with the multiple responses here? Bunch of guys sitting around the table, uh, and we said, "Okay, which which is the most important here? Is it the viscosity, um, or or is it the regression rate, which is really tied to the performance? Because everything about hypersonics, it's all range. Right? Every boils down to range. Can you get there, and can you be at least five Mach five or whatever? Uh, in fact, you might even not be hypersonic to be Mach four point five. But if we can get better range out of it, then that's a trade story. Uh, but to your question." Um, we did weight those, and the prediction profiler does have where you can kind of put in your weights of each of the responses, uh, and that was done by the subject matter experts. Um, so you can see right here that you know we have uh, pot life, we have shore A, so we have a lot of mechanical and engineering type properties that we believe will project well into figuring out the grand prize of will it have enough range, kind of thing. So it was more of a, a the subject matter experts uh, coming back to this bullet here. Uh, is is those SMEs uh, are very important for the process. Okay, we have another question. Oh, great talk, thank you. Uh, so this is a question both for you and the previous speaker maybe. So uh, two parts. The first is, are there any uh, theoretical uh, justifications for SVEM? That's one part. And the other thing is that uh, both SWEM as well as neural networks and other things uh, seem to require a lot of computations. So if you can comment on, you know, how... how so, the, so with regard to computational um, resources, I have not found it to be an issue at all doing uh, their recommended 200, uh, particularly because we only have uh, a handful, 100 uh, observations that we do in the speed mix type thing. Uh, that said, I don't know how this would work if I had uh, a million observations and had to do this FEM, um, you know, 200 times on it. So, um, now theoretically. Yeah. Yeah, so it is. Um, in the implementation in Jump Pro 17, it's all in C++, so the, the model fitting for SVEM is about as fast as we could possibly make it. Um, on the theoretical side, as I mentioned, there's still a lot of work that could be done here, and we found this kind of empirically by trying a whole lot of different things and doing simulations. And so our recommendations are based on what we saw in a large number of, of those uh, those situations that we, we set up and evaluated, it would be great if some theoretician was able to come along and um, provide you know better uh, mathematical support for what we found empirically. Chris, Chris, could you comment on? I think Trent and you and Phil published this. Um, oh, we did. Yeah, we published this in um, in Chemometrics in 2021. So if you look up Chris Gottwald, Phil Ramsey, Trent Lemkis, Chemometrics, it'll it'll pop right up. I should have had the um, the citation right there in my slides, but I, I forgot to do that. And, and have you had much feedback from the community on what people have seen the article? Uh, so what I've seen the most of is I've seen a lot of Jump users presenting, you know, their success stories with SPEM at Jump Discovery conferences. And then this is my first time actually attending a non-Jump conference in three years. And so 
between Jim's success here. It's all, it's all, at this point, there's simulations and anecdotal evidence, but there's still just a lot of work to be done. Okay, we're just about out of time. Does anybody else still have a question? Well, then let's thank all of our speakers. Thank you.